Hi, Dragana. Hi, Ana. Kako si? <laughs> Dobro sam, čekaj samo da se uključim. Uh, Dobro sam, kako si ti? Odlično sam, baš mi je drago da si se pridružila. <laughs> Sa svim slučajno. Jesi dobila moj e-mail? Jesam, Pozdrav. dobila sam i razlučam ove, da možda pozovemo e, Eugena Matusova, ali on je pisao o matematici, on, je, on ima nekoliko članaka, ja nikad nisam pisala o tome, možda ćemo i zajedno, ali njega da pozove. Što da ne, što da ne, mislim, uradi to. A, znaš kako, ja sam se setila tebe i onda sam potražila i onda sam videla ovaj Zoom call i rekao, ajde, i hvala ti na ovom a, članku koji si poslala, izvanredan članak, naravno, tako da se radujem što ćemo Ko, da pričamo. Koji članak sam poslala? Ja sam pa, već... da. Šta? Pa ovaj članak za, za, za club, book club. A, za book club. A, o, dobro, ja mislim nešto kažem. Ne, 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 nisam znala za taj članak, izvanredan. Pa, on je tek 22. objavljen. Da. da, da. Tako da, ovaj, baš mi je drago. Sad dobro, ćemo... kaži mi kako si ti, šta ima novo. Dobro sam, evo ovde. Pripremam jedan specijalni broj našeg ovog časopisa Dialogic Pedagogy Journal. I tu ja radim razne vrste poslova, tehničke, a da ne govorim uredničke. Tako da ove, sam u sad oču da ga završim, da izađe do 15. januara. <laughs> I ja, ja se bavim editorskim poslom i svašta, tako da... Šta radiš ti? Znaš šta, ja sam se penzionisala a, 1. jula prošle godine. Uhum, uhum. I tako da sam sad u penziji, ali i dalje naravno radim research, pišem, organizujem stvari, imam studente uhum. i tako. Eto, to je. A gde si ti posljednje predavala? Na University of Windsor A? u Ontariju. U Ontariju. Da, 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 to je jako dobro. Čudi me da ovaj još nije Eugence, Evgenije došao. <laughs> Ono obično prvi dođe, ali valjda će sad. Dobro, kaži mi samo objasnim ja, ideju oko book cluba, kako okay. to, Ove, koliko se često viđate, šta radite i to. Jednom mesečno, okay. uglavnom uh, je bilo kao posljednja, posljednji utorak u mesecu, međutim to se sad šeta, zavisno od toga kako. A to je deo ovog našeg projekta koji zovemo Univerzitet studenata, a, ja ću da ti pošaljem i linkove za to. Imamo drugih klubova također. Imamo Educationalist Club a, gde se sastajemo. A, čekaj samo jedan moment da, a, da mu pošaljem za to. Ne može što ne zna, ovaj, nije gledao da mu piše paskod. Aha. Ove, imamo a, tu još, a, ja imam još jedan klub koji vodim, to je Play, Education and Play Club, a, a, a onda imamo, a, imali smo mnogo više klubova, taj nam se projekat malo pome, poremetio zbog ovog rata u Ukrajini, jer smo imali puno i Rusa i Ukrajinaca koji su mm-hmm. u, u organizaciji bili, a, i ne samo od Ande, nego i od Avde, ali ih je pomelo sve to što se dešava. I onda ovaj, malo nešto ide kasnije. Ali ovaj klub, Book Club, on je u stvari već 30 godina traje na Univerzitetu Delaware i tamo smo ga neformalno držali. Mislim, držali uglavnom su ljudi koji tamo studiraju ili su postdiplomci dolazili tamo. I onda smo odlučili da ga proširimo, da ga stavimo na ovaj naš. Sve jedno, mi smo uglavnom dosta nas je istih se skuplja. Ali zavisi kako kad. Tako, uglavnom... Imamo... Evo vidite, ja sam se pridružila. Pa ja... Da, bit će divno da. ako hoćeš. Ja ne znam šta, šta je tebi u stvari glavna, gla, glavno interesovanje tvoje. Pa znaš kako, meni su glavno interesovanje, ono intimno su research metodologije. Znaš, mene jako interesuje 
i kvantitativni, kvalitativni, različiti pristup i riseču. Ali ja sam matematičar, matematički edukator. Eto, to mi je ona užna specijalnost i tehnologija. Aha, čekaj, nešto mu ne odgovara. E, ti si u ovaj paskod unik... Nisam morala da ubacim paskod. A nisi morala. Čekaj da mu ja pošaljem. Ok. Ok, samo da mu ono će da ubaci tako, a ne može... Nekoliko puta mu se to dešavalo. Ne znam zašto mu ne radi pas kod. Neka ide preko... Preko onog linka, da, da, da. Preko linka, ali preko web browsera. Da, da, da. Sada da mu pošaljem. Samo da mi se otvori Skype. Niko mi se mnogo nikad nije žalio za to. E, sada da mu sa ovog Zooma pošaljem... Ovako, invite. A gde je on? On je nekoliko blokova daleko od mene ovde u Filadelfiji takođe, ali čekaj da vidimo ovako. Obično se ovaj kopira, ali sada mi se nešto ne kopira. Gde mi je to? A to valjda ideš na participants, right? Da, evo ti ga ovako. Sad sam mu preko Skype-a poslala. Da, inače možeš ovde da klikneš dole na participants. Da, da, to sam i uradila u poslu. Dobro. Dobro, kaži mi kako su ti deca, šta ima novo? A, evo ga. O, ok. Prelazimo na engleski. Yes, hi. Hi, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Well, for some reason, it doesn't work for me. Um, no, mm. if, if you click on that uh, HTML link through the browser, then you don't... Okay, even... no, okay now, Anna, you're not allowing me to start my video. I didn't know, are you? Okay. It says that. Okay, yeah, there is on. some... Okay, the, I, I, I see. Why is it that? Uh, allow... Wait a moment. You know, I think we should use my Zoom. It's uh, it's well, doesn't. Well, we cannot now. Uh, uh, hold on. Uh, it says that you're not using, but I cannot unallow. Uh, I cannot start. It says okay. You cannot start your video because your host has stopped that. My host. It's, it's me. your host. Yes. It's you. And, and I cannot use my video. When how did you join? You send me uh, the last thing. You send me a link. Okay, let me uh, get out of here and try okay. one more time. Uh, try not to use anything because. Okay, okay. It never. Nikad nije tako bilo. Čekaj, moram. Vrućina mi je. Ja sinoć smrzavam, ali ovde mi je sad vrućina. Previše sam se toplo obrnula. Ah, again. It's the same. I cannot use it. How do I put what wait is allow multiple allow okay. Make I host. Think, if I, I make you host, okay. I'm making you host. Now you will be able to do what you want. Let me see. Yeah, now now we can. Okay, good. Hi. Yeah, but I'm afraid other people cannot join. I don't know what it is that doesn't work. Uh, that what you said me. I cannot get through. I don't know, but you could get through the link that I sent you on Skype. Yeah, and the link is direct without... Maybe you should send everybody that link. Okay, let me because just send the that. The previous ones that were there, when mm -hmm. you schedule, it's a required passcode. On that schedule also there is that same link that doesn't... No, but right now it doesn't require me for that. Okay. All right, let me just send everyone again. In the meantime, you and Dragana can get to know each other. Yes. Hi, Dragana. Hi, Eugene. How nice are you? With you. I'm, I'm fine. How are you? Oops. Not, not bad, thanks. Yeah. This is my first time. I was just explaining to Anna that I 
So I was looking, searching for her. And mm. then I went to her website and then saw different links and saw Zoom links. So I said, okay. And then I read, I, uh, sorry, my computer wants to restart. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. So, yes, and then I saw the article for your book club and mm -hmm. read it and enjoyed it immensely. So I said, I have to join the discussion. So that's my story. Okay, okay. And uh, did you have any problem to join the Zoom or not? Because I no, couldn't. not at all. So no, no, strange, because why would I have these problems? Even yesterday, I tried the link and it, and I, I was able to use Zoom, although the call didn't start. So even record, recording started. Yeah. So I, yeah, unfortunately, I have this private uh, uh, Zoom that I'm paying pri like prime. And it requires me security, either to put passcode or to put the waiting room. Mm -hmm. I thought passcode is better because people can get in even if I'm not there, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe we should use my Zoom because it doesn't work. Your Zoom is, has problems, at least for me. Well, in the future, will you use my Zoom? Yeah, yeah. And the, and, and the passcode does not help you? Absolutely not. Hmm. That's very unusual. And I put it, you know, I uh, I put it in the in my word, and then I copied there, and it didn't work. Hmm. But uh, if you but use the direct the... link that you sent to me, but why you cannot use that direct link to all the time? It's in if you look on my invitation when I invite through and on mm -hmm. the calendar, it's there. The same link. Yes. But why it's asking me uh, for password? Because you're not going through the link. You're going through putting my uh, name in. No, link. no, I will not. Are you I was going using the browser. Put that link in the. No, browser. I didn't use the browser. I got notification from my, uh, from uh, from my Zoom. You know, because there is a scheduled. Uh, let me yeah. see how it's doing that, if I can. No, probably I cannot. I cannot see how it's scheduled. I'll tell you how it's scheduled. On the calendar, it's like this. I'm, I just copied it. And it says on the calendar, like that. And if you click on that link, then you don't need the password. If you enter uh -huh. this ID, then you need this password. There oh, is I, 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 no, no, no. I, I gave you the wrong password when you asked me. I put uh, not one, but a uh, exclamation mark. It's one, one. It's one? Oh, that's probably Yeah, I, I did because I, uh, my my fingers did the wrong thing. Yeah, well, in this case, yeah. I couldn't. Right. Yeah, right. so there's but, one but there. The link, not... This link, it doesn't require a password. So this is, let me say what I had in my, that mm -hmm. I was using. But in, you know, now at least we know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. right. Because the problem sounds like, okay, because this is what I was using. Uh, Let's see. Let me show it to you. Because it's so strange. Uh, at least we know what the problem is that you send me wrong password. Yeah, and yeah. by the way, Anna, please, in future, include that password in it's all. always there. Because it's always in every. Mine is not. And I'm getting that from uh, from a Google, uh, you know, from Unis. This is the link that I got. And it's exactly the same, but it's required a password. So you need to send exactly if you, this. If you open the, that notification on the Unis uh, calendar, you, uh, you, you will know, see it's getting, exactly what I said. Be the password yeah. in bold, everything. Uh, again, uh, I'm getting, you know, it's get to my Outlook automatically. And in my Outlook, let me tell you what's get there. It's get there. Uh, uh, okay, let me see. Uh, interesting. Okay, maybe we will just uh, find that out uh, later. But 
I'm, I'm no, not getting that's it. Not, no, I think we should start the meeting regardless. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and uh, since I was looking at the other stuff, uh, let's just uh, yeah, introduce Dragana you, yourself, and we will um, Eugene will introduce himself okay. and me myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dragana Martinovic. I am a professor at University of Windsor in Canada, in Ontario, Canada. I am a mathematician and mathematics educator. And I was uh, teaching um, future high school teachers of mathematics, uh, different courses, and of course, graduate courses and so on. So my interest, of course, uh, especially related to today's book or reading assignment is what is happening with education nowadays. And of course, I have concerns that I share with Biesta. That's all for now. Okay. okay. Thank you. So my name is Eugene Matusov, and uh, I teach at the University of Delaware in the United States uh, in education, and my interest in uh, democratic dialogic education. And uh, what else? Well, originally I'm from uh, a city that doesn't exist, which is Soviet Union. Uh, from Moscow, and I left when it was Soviet Union, so it was not still Soviet Union. So that's probably that's it <laughs> for now. <laughs> and also, of course, Dragon and me are both from the country that doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. <laughs> I left when it was Yugoslavia. I don't know when you left, Dragon. Uh, me too. <laughs> uh, okay. And. Uh, I am also interested. I'm a very close colleague with Eugene. We are working together on this uh, journal, Dialogic Pedagogy Journal, and also other. We wrote together many uh, articles and uh, yeah, a book. Uh, so I'm also interested in democratic and dialogic pedagogy. I'm also very interested in early childhood education, specifically creative processes and play. Yeah. And uh, before we start, uh, Dragana just sent me an email uh, yesterday uh, asking me, soliciting for a paper for a book that they were preparing. And she may say more about that, about the uh, yeah, mathematics education uh, from dialogic point of view. So I said, maybe better you would be the writer than me because you much more know that area. Uh, I may be like co-author or something, but not the first author on that kind of a, a journal, uh, 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 article. And what deadline is September or something like that? So yes, it is fall, to fall think days, about yeah. like uh, uh, Dragana, we will give you uh, Yuji's email or I can forward the one that you sent me. And so he'll decide about that. By all means. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the thing is, I, I wrote about that already, so I don't know what else I can say, because math is not specific my area, but I wrote about exactly math. I can, if you want, I can just send you, uh, it's uh, it's a chapter in my book and uh, that recently published, so you can look at it. So, but again, I'm not sure, uh, this is not my area again, and I'm not, I don't know what else I can say about that. Uh, also, I wrote a book about math, very interesting math education, uh, not necessarily from dialogic point of view, uh, but from kind of agency point of view. Uh, and uh, again, it was published as a kind of all issue in the journal. It's like the book is an issue in the journal. Uh, I can send you that as well if you get you know, interested. But again, math is not something that. That's that's not a problem at all. We have uh, um, a diverse group of people who will yeah. be contributing to the book, and uh, some will talk uh, write about artificial intelligence and mathematics education. Some will talk about cognition, maybe uh, intellect and uh, and giftedness in mathematics education nowadays. What I thought would be interesting for Anna and of course for you now is maybe um, because Anna is uh, working on play and also gestures and um, 
different kinds of communication. So maybe you can write together some philosophical paper on how that may transfer to learning mathematics from, you know, even from your experience. So we have cognitive scientists there. We have um, one person from University of Toronto who is, um, whose interest is in um, writing and, and English. So I thought, okay, so there's also Anna's interest. So the, uh, we could have maybe a section in the book related to language, communication, and so on. So you know what? Think about it. And okay. uh, once we, we, have, we know yes. more, we will send you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, usually in our book clubs, we, we have a ritual here. Like who is a good student? Uh, people who re read the whole book, or in this case, article, and who is becoming a good student? <laughs> Those who are in any way just maybe read the title, but interested in that or some parts of it, whatever. So I can say I'm a good student. I, I read the whole article. What about you, Zhenya and the Dragon? <laughs> Well, I, I'm afraid that we all put uh, good students today, right, <laughs> Dragon? <laughs> yeah, that's I agree. Short, right? It's a short article. Yeah, yes. this is a remnant when this club was part of the University of Delaware, graduate students, probably. No, it's not only graduate students, but I think it's good to not to have that pressure that uh, people yeah. will read, because sometimes people join, and today I'm pretty sure that somebody couldn't join, maybe, but uh, just because of technical issues. But sometimes people don't did not read, but they want to join and listen to that. So kind of that peripheral participation is welcome. Mm -hmm. Also, these people usually responsible for asking us so-called stupid questions, like what is the whole thing is about, because it's that stupid questions sometimes extremely deep. Because you know we've read everything. It's kind of sounds very stupid if somebody asks like, "What's the article is about?" Because we've read it, like you don't know what it's about. But when the person who didn't read asked that question, it's helpful because suddenly you can start realizing that we read it differently. And we might say that it's, one person says it's about this, and I said it's about that. And it's, it's become interesting discussion. That's why uh, the history of that, why it's actually useful to have people who either did, didn't read at all or read something or just look through. Mm -hmm. uh, I, agree. Also, yeah. I agree and I think we always read it differently because we notice different things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so maybe we can start again it's a stupid question what it's about because uh, again it sounds like like uh, you know what it's about but maybe we can start something with more like what you like in this article if, if anything you, you like it and maybe we can go in the circle and just say what we like about that, then maybe we can go and say what we don't like about that, and then maybe we can just open for whatever things happen. Like right. So, what did you like uh, about it, Dragana? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you start from me? I'm, I'm new here. I'm, I feel okay, sorry. vulnerable. <laughs> Okay. Start with yourself, Anna. What do you like okay. about this okay. So, Okay, I'm starting with myself. <laughs> what I liked in this article is that uh, it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it uh, talks about the topics that are very, I think, important in today's education, uh, about uh, 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 the whole approach to education, who actually should be deciding about education, uh, where the pressures come, what the problems are from these pressures. And uh, Biesta, I know his other works also. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he is a progressive, let's say, progressive educator, would like to somehow uh, engage the student more, emancipate the student more, and he uses Mollenhauer uh, as some kind of a lot of his ideas, but he also has a problem uh, about how that would completely change the education. So I think the topics that he is using uh, are very important and give a lot of uh, possibility for thinking and for thinking ourselves where we agree or disagree. And I would say that I disagree with a lot of things that he says, but maybe not with everything. 
but this is what I like. It's a provocative for, th for thinking. Yeah. What about you, Yuji? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's actually, uh, was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit scared when I read this article. I'll tell you why, because I'm shocked that he was working on a kind of similar problems that I'm working now. And I published from 21 to 22, it's exactly the same time. Uh, our approach is very different, uh, and I a lot of disagree with him, but I'm a little bit <laughs> perplexed now, like uh, what's uh, what's in the air that we, both of us, uh, uh, addressing uh, tensions, it's the same tensions, I would say, not the same, the, how we formulated, we formulated very differently uh, in disagreement because I'm not a progressive educator and I criticize progressiveness. And by the way, I can see a lot of his struggle in this article, which he hides from the reader. And in my view, and I think he's aware of that by hiding, uh, it's not he does it's not his blind spots. I think he hides them from the readers knowing perfectly well what it's about. Uh, and uh, but it's still how, interesting. How you, based on what do you say that? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, based on the clear asymmetry in his article, like, for example, uh, he spends time on criticizing what he called instrumentalism, uh, while not well, and he rather well defined it, but he's not well defining what he called uh, uh, kind of institutional, schoolless institution. He's not just defining that. And in my view, if he start defining that, he will run into the program problem with his progressivism. And he it's very difficult for me to say, like, he stopped there. And I don't believe that he's not seeing what the problem is. He's seeing that, but I think he's uh, BS, I read a lot of BS. He's very uncomfortable with things that he doesn't know what to do with that. In other ways, he's... Um, not comfortable with uncertainty or publicly talking about uncertainties that he has himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's almost everything is there except to say that uh, elephant is in the room and he's not doing that. And again, I don't think it's a blind spot on his part because it's that asymmetry should bother him that he, at the end of the day, he's not so much talking about what he wants to talk. Which is uh, school is institution. So how it should look like? So how the da, da, da. that's that's part is kind of very he he uh, discuss why it's needed uh, rather well in that short article, but not what it is, and or how what's his vision of that? And in my view, it's running into problem for him, which he doesn't want to open for us to see. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting um, what I heard from both of you, because you said that you disagree to some extent with him. Um, I started because I know his previous work and I know that he is provocative. I think nowadays we need provocation in education, especially. It's just like a, a swamp that I see, you know, going uh, in the direction that I don't agree with necessarily. So I expected a lot from this article. And uh, for me, it was very interesting idea to discuss school as an instrument and school as institution, comparing it to, to school as institution. Uh, also, it was very interesting for me to read the literature that he is citing. I'm not familiar with that literature. It's not my field but I'm looking forward to read more and also to read your articles, Eugene, uh, you, you. that you said you, you wrote. It was interesting uh, while I was reading uh, his article and maybe that's the point in which we, maybe all three of us agree. I, uh, as, a, as a novice reader of the field, this, this field, this mm -hmm. topic, I had one expectation and then I wasn't sure where he is going. And that's what you are probably calling he is unclear himself or he maybe doesn't dare to, to be straightforward. So uh, 
Yes, he ended up in a wishy-washy way. Uh, mm -hmm. I expected a little bit more straight, straightforwardness. But nevertheless, I think asking the question is so important. And no, no, I, I, I agree. Discussion. No, absolutely. In this case, this uh, the tension is there, and it's very useful tension. I will differently define him, uh, that tension, not like him. And there is a reasons why I'm different from him, because I'm coming from uh, democratic dialogic education, not progressive education. And that's why I see that the tension is differently. What, what's striking for me is that the tension is the same in the just published article uh, just uh, uh, actually a few weeks ago, which is, uh, uh, he called it uh, the, the tension between instrumentalism and, uh, and institutional I'm not calling it like that. I'm calling it the tension between uh, unity versus society as a model for kind of what I call sociality of educational sociality. It's what like was the first? I didn't hear. Community. Community, oh, community, community versus, versus, society. versus society. Yes. Okay. And, and how do you see the parallel between instrumental and, and institution mm -hmm. between community and society? Yeah. What he calls. Uh, uh, instrumental, I call it community, but again, it's not the same thing. And he's very harsh on that, and I'm absolutely not like him. I'm not that harsh on the community as he is. And he's putting either or. And I'm not putting that either or, but nevertheless, I claim that what I call society and not uh, institution. Uh, and, I did, and I know why he's using the word, uh, term institution there. Uh, it's a, a it's a kind of priority over community. It's not so in a way communities are, uh, can be a part of this, but nevertheless the the priorities should be on the society, not on the community. And uh, again, I don't know how much um, uh, you know that there is a lot of uh, talk about like community of learners, for example, and constantly seeing that. Um, idea of the community is very strong. And he uh, and I, there is some parallel with that because community heavily based on the one culture and it's trying to build a one culture. It's a uh, consensus, yeah. Yeah, it's not complete. It's not, not like, he's caricaturing a lot in my view. What? It's much more caricaturing, caricaturing, making caricature of that. Because for him, it's just, first of all, it's like, it's very rigid kind of thing. And also it's top down from his point of view because it's coming from the from the so-called society. I'm not I'm not using the way society is how he using it. Um, and I can tell you why how I'm using that. I'm using it uh, much more from original notion that uh, society comes from the notion of city. Mm -hmm. And the city historically is a union of uh, tribes. Each tribe, in a way, that's what community is. Again, and it's not necessarily fully consensus-based, not true. But what's true is it's very difficult to transcend, for a person to transcend uh, the community of the tribe. It's very dangerous to do. It's very difficult. And community gives a lot of um, support, a lot of strength each, each of the person. Like the people don't feel alone. They feel uh, kind of uh, community helps to promote person voice. Uh, it's really mobilized around the person to protect that and make that much stronger. But uh, there is <laughs> uh, uh, expense of that. Expense, you have to also support the community. You need to mobilize on the community behind. It leads to tribalism. It leads to that xenophobia. And many other things that community is known for. Uh, so community has both uh, very strong attractors and, and very also strong problems with the community. Uh, just uh, one little, I think he's using the word society, what you would describe as community. No. No? No? No. 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 He using that instrumentalism, what he actually, what I describe as community, because and it's true that community can almost become mechanical. You know that German 
I forgot what's his that German uh, sociologist. Uh, he talked about two types of the in a way communities: one organic community and oh. another one mechanical community. Stirner? No. No, no, not sure. No. If, uh, if you get, I can get it. Uh, static with tenor or something like that. Uh, and there is German terms for that, which is don't ask me to oh, repeat. Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft. Right, exactly. And he introduced that, uh, that is a German sociologist, Tanner or something like that. I, I, if you want, I can find even reference to that. Okay. But, yeah. yeah, but it's it's not uh, important. Uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, he basically talks about this mechanical community. But I disagree with him because it's organic community fits to that as well. It's, it's actually much stronger because mechanical community is much easier to uh, get around to play. With organic communities, it's very difficult to get out of this because you're almost like enmeshed in that. Uh, what, what we came to this notion of uh, society, which coming from the city and uh, all these terms, like for example, civility, come uh, if you look at the word civility or polite, to be polite, polite comes the word polis, which is Greek term and civility, it's uh, the same city, but it's a Latin word or, or, or actually a Roman word. For that right. and but it's the same kind of things so society is actually what's interesting is society expects that there will be many communities and they in disagreement with each other but they also have a synergy to get together there are some foreigners there that don't belong to any community and they can visit there or actually live there and nobody expects them to kind of assimilate to the same values as anything and also city doesn't expect that there will be common values there is common interest and synergy of the things but not necessarily common values or common even language there are many cities that languages many everything like practices languages it's a mess there and it sometimes creates a lot of tensions but nobody expects that result in very nice way and this is where he's coming to and uh, what he called institution, which is not institution at all. But I tell you why he using this terminology. Mm -hmm. And what's the tension he has, that has problem? Uh, uh, and why he so unclear at the end? Um, because he's correct in my view that democratic society, uh, which is society in, in my term and in his term, actually, in this case, we agree at that term, is based on uh, pluralism. Uh, which is not uh, could be incompatible with each other. And by the way, the, uh, that's expectation of the city that communities can be incompatible with each other. The only that's what he says too that it doesn't right, have right. to be consensus. Mm -hmm. Disagreement, right, right. disagreement is. Uh, but it's it's uh, permanent. It's permanent dissensus. Not because you know some people uh, like Habermas would also say there is disagreements, but they resolvable. And mm -hmm. he's correct about that, that unresolvable. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only thing is about that, it's trying to keep peace. By the way, he's using some of the literature that I'm using as well. That's also interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, um, what's her name? Mo Mahi. Like, um, he's using, it. by the way, the same Chantal, book. Uh, it's spelled M U F F E, Mahi. And that's a, from political from, sociology, a very interesting. From uh, Belgium. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, kind of we're on the same page. The problem is, and this is where he stops, because mm -hmm. he's in big danger, in my view. <laughs> because if you start thinking about if you want to promote that, in a way, education should fit to that democratic society. And as soon as he starts doing that, he will lose control right. of that. Because think about how he writes about, he writes about like a bird eye view on this, but don't I view impossible for this type of enterprises? Mm -hmm. Because you it can be only within. And if you within, you cannot tell everybody how to do things. But he is progressive. He wants to tell how to do that. He wants to talk on behalf of society. And, and there is no one voice. And he knows about that. He wrote himself. You cannot make a one voice about that. For community, you can, but for the society, you cannot. But, and which? Uh, mm -hmm. 
he's mm -hmm. talking about the uh, to get uh, pressure off of the institution, the society pressure from the institution. So that in, what he calls institution or the territory of education, province of education, should be free from the society pressure. Well, uh, uh, yeah, the thing is, he's constantly in my terminology. He's uh, he's uh, jumps, and you can see that between society and society. One society is community, actually, and another is real society. Right. And and the, well, that creates actually difficulty to understand what he means because in one case he uses society in one sense, in another in another sense. In one right. sense, he's so you, society is kind of united and stable and whatever da, 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 da. and in another sense it's not and it's in my view that creates also not good problems you know, because he, it's difficult to talk about like that right. plus you know that when he called institution why is it he suddenly talks about the institution he stopped talking about institution exactly and it's it's drops there it by, by the end it becomes that assumes that we all know or and then he talks no 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 it's not assumed no, no i disagree with that it's not because we assume that we know what it is it's because he doesn't know what to do with that that's true so that's possible but uh, that opens uh, our discussion right yeah, yeah. because he he in a way lets us discuss these things because uh, nothing is resolved, mm, nothing no. is decided. No, no, no. He's not. No, that's. I no, but I'm just saying because yeah, we all three of us are not getting that sense that we read the solution piece. It is more um, a provocation to think about it. Yeah. No, what I, I disagree. Liked, with you. What I liked in the paper was. Uh, the idea of grow, growing up, so looking at from the student's perspective and thinking that, and I think that's one, one aspect of education nowadays that I see as problematic. And that is that uh, what he calls egological, so that egocentric idea that I am the person, I'm unique, and I can decide for others, and I can push others to do things for me. Uh, and I think that's a big problem. What he's saying is we need to teach students to, that, to become grown-ups, to live in the society. I don't know if you listen to Jordan Peterson to whom I list, started listening lately <laughs> a lot. But he's talking about that thing. Uh, he's talking about uh, that people need to understand that living in society need, means that you have to understand that others are important as well, not only what you think and what you want and need. So maybe that's that social aspect that uh, I agree with him. The other thing, how I understood, again, this is for me new, new discussion, how I understood his article, I like this idea of schools as instrument, instrument of manipulation by the government. That's how I read it. That's how I look at it. And that's what I see uh, in Canada, for example that schools and education are becoming an instrument of the government. They were always in some sense, but now it is really not considering any uh, diversifying views and uh, not, not even accepting any other discussion than what is prescribed. And, and that's what I see as problematic when he talks about schools as organization, how I read it is schools as somewhat protected from, I read it from government, not from the society, because of course, you cannot protect schools from parents, from everything else, from the environment, but maybe they need uh, protection, not maybe, for sure, from the government. So that's how I was reading it. And that's the part that I agree with. Well, I disagree with that exactly part. And first of all, I disagree that you cannot protect from parents. Some schools are exactly doing that. And I think they are correct about that. Um, by the way, that's very interesting how much he uh, 
brought something that's called Kantian paternalism, because Kant first uh, articulated that, which is, uh, and he can continues that. I think uh, yes, very much like Kant. He sees the huge value of emancipation through the uh, to, to having freedom to uh, develop your own personal opinions and uniqueness. But at the end, those who don't have that, as uh, he says, uh, ha have to be forced to yeah. <laughs> develop that. And that's yeah. the you know in Kant, it's like. Uh, People who are rational will come to agree with the truth and everything. But if you don't agree with that, means you are irrational or ignorant or, or evil. And so that's why education has to be forced on people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and by the way, uh, part of this collapse of this paternalism, you can see in him, although he's not making this push for that. By the way, I disagree with you, Dragona, from the point one that he is provocative. He's not. Provocative people is provocative for themselves. They put uh, the end things with the questions, not with the answers. And he's trying, he doesn't have answers, but he's pushing that as if he has them. And I disagree with that. It's true that he's provocative in a sense, there is something to discuss there, but he's not preparing us for, for discussion. He's not. Uh, you know it's, what, we're doing uh, that. Eugene? We're doing that. Yeah. Why uh, I'm let, saying, let me, I'm let saying me, that. Yeah, let me continue. I disagree with you and him about no, the no, children. Yes, yes, yes. I, I disagree that children are egoistic. This is a very wrong idea. And I can give you many, many examples. Actually, uh, egoism is actually something that society develops. Uh, and if you look, I mean, if you look uh, anthropo anthropology, and not only if you personal exam, if you have kids, then as the younger the kids, the more social they are. Late, like, for example, they try to help and engage whatever adults are doing and try to help as much. And of course, their help is not very so-called helpful. And we push them in our society. In another society, they do it very differently. But in other society, in our civilization, kind of, we push them the way. We're making them egoistic. It's not they born to be egoistic. We're making them egoistic. Uh, so on that side, I'm more with Vygotsky rather than with Piaget about that. But you know what? I, I agree with you. Egocentrism is something that egoism is. So he's, a lot of his premises, I can, I'm not buying them. A lot of his premises about, like, for example, that school exists for society. Yes, in recent time, it's true, but it was not always like that. And and. From the fact that it exists like that, why it should be? He's not he never considered that question, why it should be. I mean, it's not never. He considers, he comes from um, this uh, Kantian paternalism, exactly what Anna was describing. And that's why society has to intervene. But he himself, in a way, started undermining Kantian paternalism because Kant was, as Anna pointed out, based on the idea that a rational, well-informed people, well-intentioned people, and mature people will agree with each other, which means they will become mutually replaceable. Mm -hmm. He comes to this idea that in uh, any society, democratic society, actually in any society, it's impossible to find this oneness and harmony among things. Things will be permanently in disagreement. In this case, Kantian arguments start collapsing, but he cannot see consequences of that collapse. If it's collapsing, so how do you know that somebody rational, mature, or whatever? Because before Kant is very defined that by agreement. If you start agreement and become mutually replaceable, then it's it's a proxy to say that you're a rational person. By the way, Kant said, as soon as you're a rational person, you should be autonomous, and that autonomy should be respected, and it's your dignity. But for people who is ignorant, or people who is uh, not well informed, not mature, we can we can impose on them, we can force them to become rational and so on and so forth. And again, in the Kantian world, it's kind of uh, it's consistent. Now with uh, Biesta, it's not collapsing because now he's saying basically that rational, well-informed people will disagree and they will not come to the agreement. They will disagree, and some disagreement will stay forever. You cannot find harmony among them. So it will stay forever. So in this case, 
Uh, of course, from one rational person, another rational person might not look rational. Mm -hmm. But now uh, the principle, like for Kant, it's temporary problem. He, it's permanent problem. So what's the basis to force other people, like children, anybody else, to for education? In other words, why is it should be education for, uh, that for the society and not for the person? Right, and he he collapses that there. He cannot do that. Oh, another thing that uh, uh, I was thinking also, and Eugene reminded me earlier today, is that uh, there are two kinds of freedom that he does not actually see how he falls from one to another. And that's the philosophy of Isaiah Berlin. I don't know how much you're acquainted with that. Uh, oh, there is a, another Lay. person. Lay is true. So Isaiah okay. Berlin uh, was a, uh, a, a Russian Jewish British philosopher. <laughs> Let's, let's put it like that. He originally was born in a Russian Jewish family that he emigrated to Britain and he grew up in Britain and was also a, a diplomat for them. Anyway, so he's maybe big maybe I don't know his first name. I know of Berlin as a philosopher. Uh, yes, as a philosopher yes. and I writer. Berlin or I, okay Isaiah yes. Isaiah or Isaiah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the. Uh, he talked about two, to me, that was very important discovery in the last two or three years that I really deeply thought about it in, the, in terms of the, exactly this autonomy, democracy, and what does it mean to be free? So one freedom he dis defined as a personal freedom where nobody has a right to tell you anything. It's not freedom from not falling into a hole or from rain, but from other people. Like, what is the bubble? Uh, how big is the bubble of where people have no legal right to tell you, like, what to like, what, whom to love, or what to study, or where is that boundary? And he called it negative. Okay, let me, because it's, I think it will help if you define something like that. Nothing that is forbidden, everything that is not forbidden explicitly is allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. That's oh. negative liberty. So <laughs> negative because it's not defined. There is no definition what's in, inside that yeah. liberty. Positive li liberty is defined like exactly what Biesta tries to do, like what yes. is good for somebody. So uh, you uh, so you, in opposite from the negative, only what's allowed is free. What is not said anywhere is not free anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's just the opposite kind of way. But people very quickly from thinking, oh, I want freedom for people just especially in education, slide into this positive free freedom where you define exactly what, he, what Biesta says. What we as educators want from children is to behave like adults, like to be adult, like to take it. This is where they can have their autonomy and the right to be free. But everything that they have to do has to be defined by this uh, de defined bubble. If they are out of that, they are not free anymore. That that would be forbidden, and that is something that uh, yeah, uh, is actually uh, you can call it paternalistic because you are defining for somebody else what's good for them. You are defining final uh, values, and Berlin also was the one who uh, wrote about pluralism of values, and that values you have to always expect that there will be contradictory values where there is no middle ground, that the, you cannot find the, the solution uh, uh, to reconcile. Like for instance, he, Berlin was talking about, uh, uh, let's say a value of uh, justice, like somebody killed somebody else and now you you have to indict them and give them some kind of a, 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 a court order to go to jail or to kill them, whatever, that would be justice to pay for what they have done. And the other value of mercy, like mm -hmm. we will be merciful, we'll uh, give, uh, give, have good feelings and not really apply harsh justice or something. There is no middle ground. Either you go on one value or the other value. <laughs> and that, uh, so that was one of the contradictions. And 
what uh, Biesta wants, as a, uh, I think, as a uh, progressive educator, is to find a harmony of values. And that's positive freedom, really. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. On one hand, because he's progressive, and this is what he's coming from. On another hand, now he's realized, I think for the first time in his writing, and this is why for me it's such an interesting his paper, because he surprised me. Because now he realizing it's impossible, in principle, this harmony. Uh, and what he's what he hasn't started is to start drawing consequences from that. This article is heading that, but and he's and, and it's okay he cannot um, formulate them consequences. That's fine, but but he's he's not even letting us a reader to raise all these questions. Because he could have done, he said, you know, now I'm just at lost. I don't know what to do now with this because, uh, well, because of this, you know, this radical pluralism. It's not just pluralism. It should be called radical pluralism. Because pluralism in itself, it's solvable because you can create some kind of compromise, for example. That's one solution of the pluralism. But this is the problem. It's a radical. The, income, the, the values there can be income. Sometimes compromise is possible, but it's also there is impossibility for, in principle, in obvious to, to create this compromise. Uh, and, yeah, uh, and, and this is kind of, uh, he's not going, to, what's, what's the consequences for the education can be? And, and with his assertion that, for example, education must serve society, the biggest thing, not government, but society, that's problematic. Why is it should serve? And who is that society now? Well, you can say what society is because it was oneness. Now, what society are you talking about? The society is not, it's not entity anymore. It's a union, a loose union. It's just of the communities that choose to live together in peace and have synergy from each other. That's the only thing. There's no such thing as society wants us something. It's not anymore agent. Society is not agent anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a loose union. Uh, it's, it's it. It's not, uh, it's not the person. Because you know how it, it's almost like a person. We were like, society tell us what to do. Society cannot tell anything. Because exactly it's not, because it's not, there is nothing one in that. What's the consequences for education? It means that the people who constituting it should have voice in defining, not BS that tells them about what's education for, but they will start defining that what it's for. And primary things, of course, it's students. And that's, that, this is his base. Basically, he cannot step one step further and say that uh, students have a, uh, not only the different needs, but also rights to define what for them is education. And of course, his argument immediately, like Kant will be, but they will going to make mistakes. They're ignorant, then this and that. That will be immediately like very, very egoistic. <laughs> you know, he's not egoistic. It's children egoistic. He's not. We're not. We're adults. We are not egoistic. But suddenly children are egoistic. And that's why they need help and we cannot trust them with their decisions. Mm -hmm. You know what, when I was reading the article, I didn't get a sense that he is, defined, uh, that he is uh, taking only one route. I thought that he is providing different scenarios. That was my reading of the text. Mm -hmm. Because he was saying, um, this group may think that the purpose of education is that the other group may sure may sure no no he's mm -hmm. you know so he's giving some uh, a, a little bit of flexibility and that's why he's not coming for me with one solution and let me tell you who is uh, from this point of view who is here to give people flexibility you know this is already uh, what called domination what would you rather uh, have him do what what would you rather have? Well, I'm doing it for myself. I don't need to do it yes. to be yes. I'm doing it for myself. When I was saying that, I, I find that the most important people who uh, uh, define education is students. 
And they defined it many different ways. By the way, in ways that I don't like it, for example, sometimes I don't like it, or sometimes I like it. It doesn't matter. It's not for me to tell what the education is about. It's a part of education. That's what I realized. Like, uh, my approach comes from this idea that what's the difference between learning and education, mm -hmm. which is a very important question. Yes. Can you and say I, more about that? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I define that, that uh, first of all, uh, learning and education have a very interesting uh, uh, relationship like that. Learning may be not educational, and education may be not based on only on learning. Uh, yeah, that's that's first thing. So let's forget about the second part, which is also interesting. What else exists but, but learning this, on which education can be based? And it's exists. It's our civilization just lost that uh, interest in that for some reason. But anyway, that's another, we're not going that path right now, unless you're interested and I can elaborate on that. But yes, I think that it's important to say that. No, it's not. It's Right now, it's not. Let, let's not go that because it's it's distracts us. But let's consider learning and education only. So in my view, learning becomes education only when the person who experienced that, first of all, recognize that learning, and secondly, value it as, as uh, useful or helpful or has high value about that. That's it's become educational. So education, what makes education, uh, what's transforms learning into education, and once there is a judgment about that learning, is that, first of all, it's noticed that learning, not any learning is noticeable for people, uh, but secondly, that there is evolution of that learning, and it's positive evolution at this moment. That's its educational. By the way, it means that in later, it might change. The judgment might, of that person is changed, and suddenly, what was educational suddenly stopped being educational. And vice versa, it could be initially negative, but then it become positive and so on and so forth. So education is ephemeral in this case. It's not things that steady exist. For the, that's one thing. Another thing is a judgment of the person. So if somebody defines what's good, what education is, or what's educational, what's not educational, like playing, learning how to play video games. Is it educational or not educational? And so on and so forth. If somebody makes that judgment for that person who experienced that, it's robbing from education. It's exactly robbing from education. That's why uh, educators, educators should not be involved in the business defining what education is about. It's not their business to do that. They might uh, uh, record things. But it's not their business to define for the person who is what I call educatee, educator, educatee. Uh, and it's not a, uh, the business of educators to define that. What educators so, can so do. Do you, think that, do you think that educatee is from the very beginning, from uh, the moment that they are born, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, equipped? with that agency to decide what is educational or not. When do you see that person, a person becoming aware and recognizing having that agency? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly, it's a reverse question. It's almost an answer, you, uh, by raising that question, you're providing answer. When they become aware and they will, when they become making the judgments. <laughs> I'm turning that around, it's not like, oh, it's an age of one or three or five. It's when they start doing that. Again, the, and the question is, do the other people notice that or not? That's also an interesting question about that. And it's a good question because uh, uh, at some point it becomes noticeable, but maybe it's not noticeable, but they know them for themselves. And so, usually, so what do you think prevents them of recognizing that and how do you see schools nowadays? That Because for me, the way how I was reading this article, I was really looking from the lens of what the school became now. I wasn't looking into even historical development or my experience with my mm -hmm. own schooling. Uh, I was just observing around me You're what right. I'm noticing. 
And um, maybe that's why I found a little bit more meat in his article, because you know what, uh, Eugene, I think that, why do I think this article is provocative? Try to put this article on the, on the reading list of, of the Faculty of Education, any course. I would just challenge anybody to try to, to put this article and see what will happen. And that's why I think, you know, nowadays asking any question is almost out of question, even at the university level. In, you asked me a question like how I see modern schools. And again, yes. by modern schools, let's say, call it conventional schooling. I would say uh, that's exactly, it's an institutions that rob people from education, mm -hmm. from my point of view. Because uh, why? Because they monopolize that question, what is education? How do you know that it's education? Uh, like, uh, like what's good education? What's not good education? All this question monopolized and, and robbed, taking away from uh, students. Mm -hmm. And as, as soon as that institution on a systematic basis is doing that, it's robbing people from education. So it's, what's the uh, alternative? What's the alternative? Oh, there is a lot of, uh, by the way, let me, let me start with the uh, word schooling. It's yes. a Greek word. It's a Greek word, first of all. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it means in Greek? In, in in modern Greek, in modern people, in modern uh, Greek, of course, it was in modern Greek. Yeah, yeah. It means leisure. It's a form of leisure. Leisure. Yeah, like, 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 it's not свободно exactly. No, no, we don't have a word in Serbian leisure. Leisure. We, yes, we, yes. Do we have Do we have the word dasuk? No. We don't no, have the word because Russian word for leisure is the You can just say zanimanje, interesant na zanimanje. Yeah, let, me, let me define what leisure is from Greek point of view. It's a it's a particular type of self-actualization, mm -hmm. yes. uh, which involved like it's involved in different things how you can self-actualize yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you read, for example, uh, like Pla uh, Plato's dialogues, it's full of that. That's what the Acad Academy, Plato Academy, or uh, uh, or Aristotle Lyceum. That's type. Of, that's what schools. That's what they call yes. schools. So yes. basically, people. Uh, what does it mean? People who are not engaged in necessities. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, Aristotle defined free person not who is not slave. But uh, for every person, for Aristotle, is one whose life is not defined by necessities of the lives. Mm -hmm. It's not completely free of necessities, but necessities happen, but they're not defining, predominantly defining. Yes. That's why from him point of view, peasants were not free people, mm -hmm. uh, like artisans were not free people. Even artists were not free people because they're selling, their, they work for sale. And that's why their life was not uh, free to do whatever they want. Yeah, yes, it was not. Uh, it was heavily defined by necessities. So for him, school, among other things, was defining the primary activities of free people. In our society, of course, if you think about uh, what was, uh, who was that free people? It was uh, first of all, it was not slaves. It was uh, men, not women. Women were not excluded. Yes. And of course, it was based on slavery because the who was doing these necessities, either women or and slaves who were engaged in that. Or, uh, or you have to work with that because you, uh, you're a peasant. You don't have enough resources for that. And in our modern society, there is uh, very, again, it's, uh, the problem is that we don't have slavery. And that's why uh, heavily, heavily, most of the people, not all people, but many people uh, engage in the life of necessities. They live life, and the schools is organized. It's interesting. It's, it's, it tells children should not work, right? It's almost moving towards leisure, but it's all their life structured by assignments. Everything is assigned in school. You need to do this, you need to do that. You need to study, you need to do, 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 do which is anti-educational in that sense. It's a school in a way. Modern school is completely opposite 
to what schools were invented for. We're kind of uh, almost like uh, uh, creating, and by the way, it's interesting how much it's working hard to make this anti-educational by colonizing students' time, by assignments, by many other things. But, but if you, in broader sense, everything is assigned, like to talk, not to talk, where to come, where to sit, with whom you will be, what you're going to do, uh, and so on and so forth. Everything is assignment in school. An assignment is actually anti-educational and anti-leisure. Uh, so this is, if you ask me, where is the school is? The question is, can we afford schools? Can our society afford schools? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very good, interesting question in my view. The answer is, it's, it's, uh, can afford, it's already schools happening. Not conventional school, but other mm -hmm. types of schools. But on the small oasis, on periphery, on here and there, um, uh, and it's happened. That's one thing. But on the bigger scale, we might come in right now to time when, it, for the first time, outside of slavery, it become again possible through what it's called technological unemployment, which we might already entering right now as a big things, and it's maybe hidden from us, but that's another story. Yeah. Or maybe not, maybe it's we're still not there yet, but it might happen. Right. It's a very interesting thing that uh, many people think of education as a practice to be equal with other human practices of produ production of something. Mm -hmm. But it, actually education is not a production of, of anything. It, it is engaging in uh, activities of interest. Uh, production may be part of them, but not for the production, but, but for the personal enjoyment, learning, whatever, uh, actualization, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like was, opposite of, uh, of productive practice. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, is was, why... I was always considering uh, school as some sort of apprenticeship where teachers teach students what they know mm -hmm. and students pick up whatever they can <laughs> or they like so that they have a spread of possibilities that they can um, maybe assess what is that they would like to go in depth and to learn a little bit more. And that agency I think is growing uh, as as they uh, become adults, because they can make uh, decisions without influence of others, probably, although, of course, others have uh, power over them in many ways in, in terms of assessment and so on. But still, as you say, uh, if you are considering informal education as part of, of education, which is true, then uh, nowadays with technology, people can really go in depth regardless of the school. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. I agree with you that school is more an obstacle than, um, than what we would like, like it to be. And we see that with the student engagement up to let's say grade three, four, Students love school. All students love school, love being with friends, love learning. They're interested in things. And then it slowly goes down. And that interest diminishes. And we need to be concerned about that. Uh, I, uh, as a student, I loved school. Not because I loved my teachers, but I loved my, my peers. I would rather be in school than at home. Uh, so that's probably something that made decision for me. But um, I would love the students to like school. But now the question becomes, what? how should school look like? And that's a very interesting we question. Because, uh, no, I think that the, the question, how should school look like, is a, a trick question in a sense that there is not one way of school that should be the best for everyone. 
uh, that the people are very okay. different and not all first of all cultures uh, cultures are different second for different reasons in life you need different types of uh, approach to school some things you want to be trained like for instance to drive you want to really learn the rules and the skills to be safe driver you don't need uh, anything else than that and for other things you you need something completely different and different approach but, but the schools as uh, contemporary schools they have a lot of uh, built-in structure that is not necessary to be and we take it for granted for instance uh why are we separated by age like uh uh, for some things it's good maybe but not for everything and there are many things that when it's really detrimental that we are separated by age mm -hmm. um, uh, second thing like why is 45 minutes a class good for everyone so different school try to like Montessori try to be without classes give longer periods or have several uh, you know they they started to experiment with some but still all of that is then for everybody for a long period of 12 13 years you're marching in the same way like everybody else yes. and uh, which which we know is impossible people wear different sizes of clothes and like different like in many ways have different needs and different approaches and not general for them but for particular moment in their life and sub subject matter like uh, i like to go uh, skating but i don't want to become like a champion in skating i just like to just go around and that's enough for me. I don't need any kind of like a graduation from that. <laughs> like I don't. So there are many things that that are built into the schooling that uh, yeah uh, that still sees the students as some kind of uh, uh, meat to process. Like the students go through school, and this is the institution which Biesta yeah. doesn't see, or even if he sees, he doesn't see a problem there. His problem is how what's the autonom autonomy of the institution, not what's the autonomy of the student, which uh, uh, if, uh, in that sense, there are several levels of, of his thinking. And the one that he does not, uh, uh, the, which I think is what you, Eugene, say, he hides from everyone, is this uh, paternalistic uh, 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 an instrumentalistic way of approaching between the institution and the student, sc school and the student. And schools don't have to look like that. Like, and, uh, and there are schools do not look like that. Right. And this is very interesting. They exist already. If, and, and it's very interesting. If you look at them, they're much closer to the Greek uh, schools that were ancient Greek schools in Athens existed. Like, for example, that schools that were really called schools, like uh, Plato school or Socrates school or Aristotle school. First of all, very interesting things. They happened usually, it's if you see how they happen, they happened in Agora. And Agora, I don't know if you were in Athens, uh, it's a marketplace, but it's more than a marketplace. There is government there, there is uh, uh, places for worshiping, uh, there is places for art. It's also the courts were there. And on the, among other things, uh, it's existed uh, this, that school. In a way, school was part of this. So the people can get in and out. So for example, you can come for white things and you see a group of people around Socrates and you can join and listen to that and enjoy conversation, not join conversation. There is drinking was there. There is some sex was involved there as well, as we know now. Uh, dancing there, uh, eating there. And uh, so it's very, uh, you know, in schools, what modern schools, they try to sterilize that and they cut it out. There it's re reverse things. You see, they included that. Uh, another interesting thing is that usually this as educational things, it usually started with students asking questions, not teachers that had question. By the way, you said dragon is something interesting. The teacher knows about something and then uh, 
uh, the students joined it. Actually, it was completely reversed. In if you read Meno, this is dialogue, uh, very interesting because it's most educational dialogue. It's not the others, uh, but it's most because it can their position as a student and the teacher. Uh, unlike many other dialogues where there is not that strong sense of that. And in this case, um, um, Meno came to Socrates and asked him question, what's the origin of virtue? Well, as it's, the question sounds very esoteric, like who cares about it? Like, what's the origin of virtue? But for, it's a very, it was very super political question in Athens because if virtue is in, uh, innate, it means the best uh, way of government is aristocracy. Because that's, that's those the people who, whom, who have virtue. That's why they call noble, aristocrat, noble people. If it can be learned, democracy is better way of serving. So it was super political question. For Socrates, he was not interested in that question. He was interested in the question, uh, what's, what does it mean virtue? And first part of this dialogue is a fight between Meno and Socrates of what they should discuss. And at some point, Socrates suddenly realized, he said, wait a minute, you came to me with this question. I didn't come to you with my question. It means I have to subordinate my interest to yours. I should not discuss what's interesting for me. I should help you. Since you asked me for help, and I'm willing to provide help, so I should help you to figure out like what, uh, what's the origin of virtue. And in my view, this is a very good lesson. What's the role of educators? The role of educators is not to teach what they know. It's not what's that. It's to help students to develop their own views, ideas, values, with which teacher might disagree. And so it's not about well, movement that's, that's from the, the teacher to I the read, student. That I read in this article as well, that there is a, a conflict between what is ideal and what is real in a way. So ideally, that would be the case. But uh, working in the educational system as, as you are, we know the capacity of teachers and problems that they have and how they they don't have agency themselves to, to sure. teach students. So, so so in this case we should the not system work is corrupt. corrupt. Yeah. So we should work against the system. Not with the system, but against. <laughs> yes, yes. So, <laughs> so maybe instead of uh, thinking about what's the good system should be, maybe it doesn't could be system. Right. It's anti-systematic. I, I can tell you that many parents now, even parents who are teachers themselves, are taking their children out in, mm -hmm. in the environment out of public education. Some are putting them in private school who can. Some are uh, teaching them at home. So obviously there is some trend and I don't know where the government will, will recognize that this is a trend and if they're going to try to stop it or somehow steer it. So we'll see. But for me, the biggest question is about democracy and what is democracy? So yeah. we have on one side question, what is education? What is the purpose of education? But what is democracy nowadays? We, uh, Anna, tell about our uh, that your special issue because that's in a I way... just mentioned Dragana when we, when we met before Eugene came in lay uh, that I'm working on finalizing this special issue for our journal and the special issue is about uh, dialogic pedagogy and democratic education. Uh, how, what's the relationship with these two? And one of the very interesting things I, I write in my introduction is when we uh, send a call for papers for that, most of the proposals came uh, not about democratic education, but about education for democracy or civic education. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and one of the things is you're teaching people about democracy while they are living in complete autocracy of the school. They are not in any democratic. So they're constantly talking about some ideal somewhere else, but what's done to them 
is that they don't have democracy, uh, or maybe just a little bit, they can have a representative on the uh, faculty or about some special activities, but basically what they are learning, how they are learning, mm -hmm. whether they can learn or not to learn with whom and everything is decided for them. And there is no negotiation for that. So mm -hmm. that's not democracy. But there are democratic schools. I don't know how much you're uh, acquainted with the democratic schools. Schools no, in which... The, okay. So that's why we didn't have... Uh, most people in United States and let's say Canada never heard of democratic schools. But you did maybe if you heard of the school in England called Sum the Summerhill. Summerhill yes. School. Yes. That's, a dem that's the first and the oldest democratic schools mm -hmm. where students and teachers yes. and everybody who participates have uh, meetings in which they decide everything about every aspect of their life together and their education. Mm -hmm. And they have voting exactly everybody's vote has the same uh, value. And so there are many schools, even though people didn't hear about them, there are many schools throughout many on every continent. Maybe there is even one in Sri Lanka that we uh, we, we had somebody uh, uh, participate in one of our meetings. And there are many schools in Israel, for instance, uh, which is a very small country and there people know what democratic schools are. Mm -hmm. But in United States and Canada and in most other places in the world, they are less than one hundredth of a percent of all other schools. Mm -hmm. So what democratic schools are is exactly that. Those are schools where children from pre-K, which means four years on until 18 years old, uh, participate in all decisions about everything in that school equally, regardless of their age. And... Uh, they have uh, in most of these schools, but not in all, pretty big negative freedom in that sense that they can decide a lot of things for themselves and they are not uh, uh, forced to do things uh, at all. There is a lot of resources, there is a lot of activities going on, there is a lot of, uh, yeah, but if they, uh, nobody will teach a class if nobody is asking for that class. If nobody's asking, please teach me how to write, there will be no classes in learning how to write that, that time. Or maybe it wouldn't be a class, maybe it will be just private uh, things or something, uh, or whatever for, uh, for everything else. And so this is this issue that <laughs> finally, uh, uh, after almost four years of work, uh, how many of us, uh, there will be 13 articles, including all the uh, introductions and, and conclusions. And it's uh, yeah, me, uh, my two colleagues. Okay, here. Anna, let me, let me add things. Uh, because I was responsible to write the conclusion and I found in this kind of reading all of that, there is five understanding of democratic education there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it creates this. One of that, uh, it's education about democracy. Yes. It's not necessarily for democracy, it's about democracy. About democracy. Yeah, which can be positive or negative because there is, like, for example, in Soviet Union, we studied democracy, not because we, uh, Soviet Union, uh, the lesson was not to accept democracy, but to criticize that. Um, so there is second understanding what Anna talks about education for democracy. In a way, the idea is to become a better members of democratic society. Mm -hmm. The third one is um, using democracy to solve particular problems. Like for example, how to engage students in studying that you want them to study mm -hmm. or, uh, or to solve problem with violence that they might experience and so on and so forth. So democracy is a tool to solve problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth idea of uh, 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 democratic education is where students make uh, uh, elective decisions democratically, like for example, what to study. And they make for the democratic means, it could be different ways for voting or could be consensus or many other things, but they may decide together about that. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one, uh, it's about to consider that everybody has, each student has a right for, to define their own education. In a way, it's right for the self-education, which is they all decide questions like whether to study, which is a very important question, or not to study, 
uh, what to study, why to study, how to study, and all these questions are uh, each student has a right to define that self education. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which actually creates uh, interesting things that if you look at democratic schools, they try to create ecology of leisure, talking about that, where education is only one aspect of, or one possibility for that. For example, the other ones would be play, would be hobby, hanging out with friends, mm -hmm. other type of leisure. And they're there, and they're, uh, and they're available and this, the participant has made their own decision where and in what to engage. Right. And by the way, that schools exist. It's not, it's not they're not. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm learning now with you yeah. uh, or yeah. from you. Yeah. I actually did a quick search uh, for uh -huh. uh, democratic, schools, yeah. democratic yeah. schools in Canada, and uh -huh. I found nine schools in Canada. Yeah. One was uh -huh. closed in 2007. And yes, mm -hmm. they are uh, private schools. So now my question is, what is your sense now for reading your book? What is your sense? Who are the students going to these schools? So how do they end up being in these schools? Uh, it's a different, uh, depends, of course. Uh, which country you're looking like? For example, in Israel, they finance by the public education, by the public money. But hundred percent, but a, a big, big portion. Uh, parents uh, in Israel have to add more money to to their private uh, to the democratic school than they would have to pub other conventional schools. Yeah, yeah. in the United States, uh, I'm not sure I know well in Canada. Uh, they have to be private schools, and many schools, not probably all, but some schools, concerned about this issue that of money. But the school that I know, for example, uh, that nearby Harrisburg, that we're going to visit actually this Friday, uh, there was a study, they did self-study to see their demographics and stuff like that. And they compare their demographics with uh, uh, neighborhood, since it's neighborhood school, uh, they look at the, what's, what's around them. And they found that to, be, to their own surprise, the demographic is a little bit low, the, the in a way, people around them. From socioeconomic status, they checked about uh, different things like race, uh, other things, and they found they're more or less compatible with what's around them. But so, so it's interesting, but I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure that it's not true for every democratic school in the United States. Because you see, I'm reading about only one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, founded in 1983 by the Ontario Ministry of Education and Training. So the ministry mm -hmm. uh, expressly mm -hmm. for home educators, alternative needs, and like-minded families. So now mm -hmm. my question is, mm -hmm. why would be government... Why would government uh, would have interest to organize such school? Obviously, there are nine schools, let's say, a very small number of schools in Canada. Why mm -hmm. would be government interested in, is it to actually isolate these people or to actually provide support to some people and who are the people? So that's that's my question. In Israel, I can tell you. Uh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Israel is different, I know. Right, but that's the only place that I know where the government. Okay, actually... let me let me uh, say that, uh, Dragon. It's it's interesting question, but in my view, wrong question, because in democratic uh, countries, in democratic countries, uh, government has to uh, be uh, responsible to people. So the question is not about why government should do it; it's why people are interested should be interested in that. And in my view, this is the right question because in this case, people have, can express their voices into that, uh, into making this um, uh, need for that. And I actually can kind of help to, uh, not only I actually, uh, we together were doing that, but uh, kind of can formulate why there is a public interest in that. And this is what the question is. It's not government. Government is not interested in anything. 
unless people in the democratic states plans, unless uh, people will push for that, people want that, and then government might respond to that. If not, there should be fight for that within the public discourse, public voting, and so on and so forth, for a political fight. Uh, why the public has interest? The uh, public should have interest for that uh, for several reasons. And, and I'm uh, giving them not in the order of importance because uh, there is importance for whom? Different people who have different priorities for this importance. But uh, let me provide some of them. One thing, it will stop these uh, educational wars of different people who are fighting with each other for monopoly on education, on public education specifically. And it will end this wars because uh, these wars are terrible and absolutely unnecessary. And wars going on among different pathways, uh, different uh, like religious education, philosophy of education, political uh, visions, value systems of education, they should be stopped. And, uh, and in order to stop that, it, they should be democrat education has to be democratized and the uh, uh, the principle of radical pluralism has to be accepted as a way to live in peace in the society. Because this wars pulls society apart. Mm -hmm. And they continue pulling. I don't know how it's strong in Canada, but the United States, it's very strong. It's, and it's getting very worse, much. worse, and worse right, right, about right. that. So, so this is one super important reason for that. Another part of that, it's... Uh, we don't know uh, future. The society uh, people always talk about uh, uh, education as a relation with the future. We don't know future. Future. That's one thing. Second thing uh, that uh, society getting changing so rapidly, and the the change, the speed of the changes increasing. So uh, in past we much more could more extrapolate about what future might look like and so called prepare for that. So now this uh, is become less and less true. So how to address that? To address that, one possibility to address that, instead of guessing constantly what future might be and how to organize that education, it may be a good idea to focus on the student's interest here and now. Why? Because that will be permanent for the whole life. The content of that interest will change and needs will change. Of and course. that's uh, exactly what you said, Dragana, and we all know children in school lose interest for uh, life. For They don't even know what they're interested in because that's systematically actually in uh, Because it's causing parent interest. And in this case, we don't care about how ignorant or not ignorant they are because that's not important. What's impo And whether or not they make wrong, right choices and wrong choices, the right choice is follow your interest and needs and, uh, uh, and uh, necess even necessities as it is now. Or that's generate this notion of education, which yeah, which means so value dangerous. of the learning, value of the learning, and what you, what you think that you want to learn because it has value right now. It might change that value. It's not a problem because it's not about what you're doing now will be important later. What what's important will be is that meta level, constantly meta level, that you you know how to approach in future, how to approach issues that you're dealing with, or uh, how if you need to study something, or how, how to organize yourself, where to find resources for that, when to find help for that, and so on and so forth. How to evaluate yourself. Not somebody evaluates you, but how you will evaluate yourself. Is it enough for you? Not enough. Should you move on? But you Should see, you... That is, <clears throat> I think that is one question that Biesta is asking. Mm -hmm. And that is, let's say that you have such democratic school. Mm -hmm. And I, I just didn't call it democratic. I, I knew about these examples, but I didn't use the term. Mm -hmm. So that's that's new for me, and thank you for that. But let's say that you have such school. How do you prevent, or, or how do you uh, make sure that the school is faithful to disorientation so that it doesn't become corrupted? that mm -hmm. uh, educators are doing, let's say, the right thing, that parents are not interfering with the school, that society is not bleeding in or government is putting uh, different pressures. 
So how to ensure, let's say, the quality of... And, uh, and who will define quality? That's the problem. I don't know. I'm asking you. I, no, okay. In my view, the quality is defined by the students. And you this see, is... the problem is, the problem mm -hmm. is, and I think Biesta talks about that, and that is that on one side, you have, uh, let's say, societies or groups uh, uh, interest to focus, to take one di single direction. And on the other side, you have that, you know, disruption and uh, dissolvement of everything. And uh, so how do you ensure that? You cannot, life cannot be insured. This is oh, very, but let me tell you one it, practical just, thing. Anna, yes, can, I, can, I, can I just I play and then you will. This is a difference. You see, Biesta, in my view, see the life as mechanism that you can ensure something. And he can do it because he will be the di dictator who will do that on the top of this. Because he will decide what's the quality, how do you know it, it's it's uh, correct or not correct. If we, if we count on this, is that. Yes, abuse will happen. The question is how to manage that abuse, not how to avoid that, how to ensure things. That's not the right question. The question is how to manage it. Because, uh, and also you need to be very careful because uh, if you look at the kind of uh, that metaphor, a uh, modern metaphor, if you look at the organic world, not in the world of machines, but the law, law, world of ecologies, like forest, for example, the waste for one organism is a food for another organism. And you know that, that it tried to uh, eliminate the waste, which is good for machines. It's uh, like, it's uh, not only detrimental, like you can kill organism by evaluate, uh, eliminating waste. Of course, when the waste is too much, it can be poisonous as well. No question about that, that's important. So the question is in a way, how to manage that mess? It will be mess. Absolutely. And that's life. Life is messy. It's not, that's why it's not systems. You know, systems are orderly. Life is messy. So the question is how to manage that rather than how to, uh, you know, ensure that abuse will not happen. It will happen. And it will be also problematic because for one person it is abuse and for another it's perfect, perfectly great. By the way, it's, uh, if you think about that, when we're facing with this, it's art. You know, art, look at the art. There is a lot of, you can call abuse, but other people will disagree that that's it. Who will ensure quality? The people who, uh, like audience, in many ways, ensuring, they, they judging, do they like it or they don't like it? Nobody forced people, well, so far, watching movies. And if they don't want to come to the movie, well, uh, there is several possibilities. The director will find, Small audience, maybe it's okay to have small audience, or to change how they uh, they moving them making movies, or to leave the profession. You cannot ensure things. And you, people say there is trashy art, there is exploitative art. Absolutely true, it exists. There is nothing like that. But you know the censorship or the best, or it's not the best way to answer to that questions. Like total censorship, I mean. There are certain things, there are, it's, it becomes sometimes legal issue. Maybe, you see, that's, that's part of this answer. Sometimes courts will interfere under certain conditions of the abuse. It, but we have to live with that. There is, life is messy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, can and, I and also, I wanted to say that the, uh, uh, in the example of that school with which uh, we will uh, go to and we are collaborating with them, and many other democratic schools that are built, uh, inspired by the Summer Hill. Uh, they do have uh, internal, of course, uh, meetings all the time in which people can bring all kinds of grievances and uh, those are being discussed and they have rules that they design. They have what they call judicial committee uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, it's like a courts, you know, like investigate, first of all, what happened, look for all the sides, if there is an incident, incident and make uh, 
their verdict decision and then based on the rules they can give some consequences as they say not punishment or something like that so there is a lot of meta level if we are talking about meta level of the internal uh, life of their small society in which uh, things not i would not want to call it self-regulate but they have that meta level on which they are concerned with the same issues that we are concerned here uh, but uh, no, they're not. They're not concerned with the same issue because no. they're not concerned with the abuse of education or quality of education. They're not concerned with that no, whatsoever. No. I mean, yeah, in but that sense. I wanted to say that there, um, th there is a trust that people have a right to make decisions for themselves, even to make wrong decisions <laughs> and or experience uh, mistakes and learn from the mistakes. But the worst thing, I think, for education is to take away this uh, le meta level from people mm -hmm. where they take uh, uh, their own reflection and critical analysis and uh, mm -hmm. think about what's good for me, what's not good and why. And uh, yeah, and and how does that impact other people and me and everything and in the future? But for them to then take control in their own hands, even when they are going to make mistakes, that's how learn we learn. Lee, you want to say can something? I, can I, yeah, I wanna. <clears throat> so so yeah, um, I'm glad to join you guys. Yeah, I wanna say something. Um, so I, I had a few things in my idea. One is that um, when you guys talk about how teachers and students always have different things in mind. So, you know, um, so we, we want to teach Erica how to write, you know, she's in second grade. I have a daughter in second grade and she, like, and, and so, so the other day we had, we had a wonderful day. We went to eat our lunch and we played fireworks, you know, it's approaching new year in china we we played fireworks with the neighborhood kids and we did many wonderful things and we came home and asked her to you know write a diary of her day do a few sentences and she insisted that she doesn't want to write any of that and all she wanted to write was that she had a pen that was broken and she didn't know why it was broken <laughs> so yeah that's just made me think about and I couldn't understand why you know fireworks doesn't worth the writing about but I mean I, I I can see that the the kids will always have different things that interest them and, and it has nothing to do how we understand stuff like she noticed uh, Erica will know what is under the bat <laughs> accurately yeah and, and and we don't um so um yeah, I totally see that. And I want to say another thing is that um, about how and why you can predict future um, and, and prepare for that. So recently there's a, there's a video going viral in, 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 China's, in Chinese media. So two girls talk about their life choice. The both girls are um, 30 years old. And so they're not, they're not girls, they're, they're young, young women. And they graduated from, from first tier universities in China. <clears throat> but, but they started off saying, you know, I graduated from a very good university, but um, I currently have like 500 bucks in my account. And that's all the money I have. And I have worked very hard for the past five years. Well, uh, she worked as um, like at different companies and media and, and uh, new, well, she started like news and, and media, and then she worked in the in the um, internet companies, um, but she find it like all kinds of troubles and and she started to learn art um, and she started to want to get a graduate degree. And, and so two people talking about how, you know, they didn't plan their life well enough and they didn't went into a major or went into a company that was promising enough and so they've worked really hard for the last 30 years and they end up with nothing like like they um as a cleaner in in a restaurant to make the ends meet and some stuff like that and at the end of the video the pe two people said like we were we were actually okay like we find this is nothing to be scared of not having a job and worked as as a cleaner in a restaurant there's nothing to be scared of and we want to share these life experiences with you guys and talk about how you know, it, it, it'll be fine. 
and everybody was commenting on that video that they didn't plan their life well enough and they end up being there and there was nothing to be, be happy about. Um, and so it generates a lot of discussion about whether they were doing the right thing, like wanting to study art at the age of 28. And, and you know, so you go to, a, a, you work as a cleaner in the morning and you take art classes in the afternoon, whether that is okay lifestyle. And um, so what we were discussing about, you know, education should plan for the future um, really made me think about that. And I want to know what, what do you think? Like if, if, if you, your, your daughter, your son, you know, in her thirties want to study art and, and she had graduated from uh, she had graduated from a good university. She had worked hard all her life, um, but would work as a cleaner and and do that kind of stuff. Like, what's your comments? I want to I want to know that. Understand? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I was amazed lay when I came from Yugoslavia to United States a long time ago is a difference in United States from what was the culture in Yugoslavia. For instance, in Yugoslavia, it would be a shame for somebody who, who fi is finishing university to work as a uh, um, uh, 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 waiter in the restaurant or clean houses or drive a taxi. It would be like a failure in your life. You studied something and now you cannot do that, but you have to work in these menial jobs. In United States, it's not a failure. You can do all kinds of things to earn money. At the same time, you can pursue some other interests in the university or some other career. But while you are doing that, or even like take a, some actors who became famous later in their life, for maybe 20 years, they were trying to, to get a role that would make them famous or to, to, to just uh, live from that. But they had to, at the same time, uh, do waiters or waitering or whatever they, they can do just to have enough money. My cousin, my husband's cousin, who was an opera singer, she would come to uh, sing in an opera, but at the same time, she had to pay for hotel rooms and all kinds of, so the money that she was getting for that singing was not enough for her to live. So in between these uh, roles, when she had work, she had to live from something completely mundane, like walking other people's dogs or something like that. And nobody was here thinking of that as catastrophe or you're a failure. Uh, and that's the difference between United States. I don't know how it's in Canada, but this value system is different here than in Europe, I would say, not only Yugoslavia, probably it was, and it is still in Europe, a lot more hierarchical kind of system where uh, you are uh, evaluated as a person by your success in some higher education or higher uh, positions in life and not valuable if you're just like a cleaning lady, let's say, or something like that. I think it's very different here. Let, let me give you interesting yes. example. Uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, Lei, let me give interesting example for you. Yeah. You know that I was teaching a, a Chinese class yes. uh, this fall, and this is my, for Dragon of Fuyu especially, it's a master class for future English teachers. And I teach uh, the kind of psychology, it's kind of human development, applied human development that I teach for a future English teachers. I used to, the whole, when we started program, it's a, a dual program between um, University uh, Hunan University and University of Delaware. So the students first uh, taught by uh, American professors there, yes. and then they will come to United States. Actually, my students will, yeah. in, at the end of January, will be here in the United States. And it, when we started the whole thing, I was going uh, there first. Now, because of the COVID and stuff like that, I'm doing yeah, online. Yeah, yeah. For some strange reason, uh, Lei, I'm coming from, I need to explain context. For some strange reason, I don't understand why, uh, why it's happened. I still don't know. It's a yeah. puzzle. As soon as I start teaching, 
yeah. that class in uh, United States for the Zoom. Yeah. That class existed for American students. For some reason, we have absolutely low enrollment in that American classes in United States, in Delaware. Yeah. So I was asked to add those students to my Chinese class. Wow. So they're kind of American students, but they're in yeah. Chinese class. Let me tell you, Lei, do you know, I have yeah. a student in my class who is yeah. my age, which is, uh, I want to open my age, 62 years old. He's an American yeah. student. He yeah. worked all his life as a lawyer. And then oh, he okay. decided that he doesn't want to be a lawyer anymore. And he wants to teach English to uh, immigrant children in the United States. So he was taking the same class together with uh, Chinese students, which is much, much younger than he is. Uh, but, uh, and my Chinese students were shocked because from their point of view, this is kind of grandpa, which is the, the yeah. of <laughs> grandpa. And grandpa is supposed to uh, think about the retirement. Well, he in China, right, he's yeah. supposed to be retired. And, yeah. uh, and not to work, and not to change the profession altogether, and not to go to yeah. the... They're completely shocked, because for them, uh, if you're 30 years old, you're already old, and you cannot yes. change anything. You cannot change yeah. anything. You will start. If you don't like something, too bad. You have to continue. We, we have discussion on the uh, web talk, actually, this yeah. kind of thing. And uh, so it's a very different attitudes uh, in the United States, uh, versus China. I'm not saying it's easy in the United States. There is still what can be called ageism in the United yeah. States, but of course, no comparison with China or Russia uh, in that right. sense. Uh, like I, I still remember when I was 49, I was uh, looking for a job, just to check, and my friends in Russia say, "How come you looking for a new job? You're 49." Yeah, right. I like what? I, I don't understand. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, this is uh, so different in the sense of United States. Like Anna, you become professor, right? How old were you when you become a professor? N not a permanent job. I'm talking about permanent job. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, first time I became professor when I was 30, uh, 24. But second time when I was 55 or 56. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a big surprise about that. It's not absolutely outrageous. Like, what? It's not uh, like scandalous. In, if you say the same thing in Russia, people are. <laughs> right. Well, this so is the question say, yeah. becomes uh, le uh, these, let's say, I I'm not sure if we are talking about democratic schools, but. Uh, let's say alternative uh, path for education. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm puzzled. Would that be a path? Because now we are talking about artists. We are talking about and uh, actually my future daughter-in-law teaches in art school in Toronto, mm -hmm. and I know she was telling me about her students. Her students are mostly odd odd uh, balls, there are students who would not be able to finish regular education and they would not fit in the, in the regular school. And probably uh, some of them were unsuccessful in regular schooling. So my question is, is that alternative way of schooling, especially since it is so small part of educational system, is it a place for oddballs or it is creating oddballs mm -hmm. or both? So very interesting question. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, my sense, I would more say both. Both. Uh, both. Uh, for one thing, if uh, Eugene and I wrote uh, in 2016 an article where we thought that the schools uh, uh, public education should be public by the money, but not by the program. So the money should go to every child uh, that has to go to school to support, that's partially what's in Israel. 
And then where that child wants to go, what kind of education uh, should be decided by the child and the parents if the child is younger, but later on in puberty already, probably the child can, uh, can make that decision. The schools should get these uh, vouchers, we call them, and uh, exactly like the artists, uh, the person who studies there could offer them the voucher, but if they don't like that school, they can withdraw and take the rest of the money to some other school. So the schools would be in a position of an artist or the film director to say, are we doing well? Uh, do, do we have customers, audience? If that's the problem, what do we have to change or do can we exist as a school? So the, it would be like a self-control on the quality because the quality, there will be no captive audience. And the, uh, uh, what we have now is that the schools are financed together with the program and everybody else who doesn't fit for various reasons, either have to find another type of school or is in special education in a way or drop out. So uh, in Israel, the democratic schools that are partially a little bit more than a half financed by the government do have a reputation that they are kind of a special education because a lot of children who cannot fit, as you say, into the system uh, go there. Not all because of that, but it's a case when, when your child has a lot of problem in school, usually for, for many of them, this is solved by democratic school. There are some other schools too that are not democratic, but or, or, or homeschooling. So yes, some. Uh, but what does it mean fit into? If you only have one norm in publicly funded school, that means that you really want to produce an army of the identical people. You don't have... A, uh, latitude to for, for to support every person in and in, in the, the way of study but that's not the only thing there are different ideologies so today various religious schools are also private schools but what about if you just you could go to the school but you don't agree with the school you don't agree with what they're teaching how they're teaching you would like something different let's say musical school or dance school or something, why shouldn't that be public is, and democratic school, what, whatever else? So the question is that the system that it is now called public education is very narrow and very uniforming. And that's why it's so oppressive because it requires this uh, control uh, of quality from, from the authorities and from testing and from everything that everybody has to, I see it like that kind of like a sieve through which uh, only certain things can go through and the others that the cone can go through, they stay outside and you cannot push them through. So it's like a procrastor's bed, you know, the, the Greek guy who, who would put, put people in the bed and stretch them to the bed or cut their legs so they all had to be the same length you know and that's what our current schooling does so that that's the one of the biggest oppressions uh, but of course it, it would require a lot of a uh, different ideology about what school is or should be to just finance people for their right to choose what the school is good for them. That's all. And, and, and I think it's a good idea to treat everybody as oddball, what you call it. Yeah, oddball. <laughs> and this is actually why we are so interesting. Like when you have your friends, your friend is for you. They're not your friends because